Welcome everyone. My name is Ishaq Patan. I'm the Bay Area Director at Islamic Networks Group, also known as ING. Thanks so much for joining us for our second panel in our series titled Solidarity in a Time of Crisis, Standing with Marginalized Communities. Over the last few weeks, we've seen the ways systemic racism and inequalities have manifested against minority communities. Asian Americans have been subjected to verbal and physical acts of hate and bigotry. Black communities have suffered from disproportionate deaths from COVID-19. The Latinx community has been disproportionately hit with more unemployment and native communities are at a special risk due to lack of proper allocation of healthcare and economic resources. Our panelists today will be discussing these inequalities and their origin throughout history and we will close with how we can take action to counter it. As you may already know, ING is a peacemaking organization dedicated to face-to-face -face education and engagement to foster understanding of Muslims and other misunderstood groups to promote harmony among all people. This series is an extension of our Intercultural Speakers Bureau, a new program from ING, which examines the roots, in Islam, the roots of Islamophobia and other forms of bigotry, including anti-Blackness and anti-Semitism, as well as the interconnectedness of all bigotry directed against Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, Sikh, Black, Latinx, Asian, and Native American populations. I'm gonna begin as I did last time by introducing four of our panelists from the Asian American, Muslim American, Jewish American, and Black American communities. First, we will hear from Maha al Janadi, the founder and director of ING, the organization bringing you this webinar series. Maha has a graduate degree in religious studies from Stanford University. After Maha, we'll hear from Rabbi Melanie Aaron, the rabbi of Congregation Shir Hadash of Los Gatos, California. Rabbi Melanie was ordained at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. After Rabbi Melanie, we'll hear from Pastor Coloma Smith, the pastor of University AME Zion Church in Palo Alto, California, he was ordained in Mount Vernon, New York. And finally, in the first part of our webinar, we'll hear from Dr. Hien Do, who is currently professor at, of sociology at San Jose State University. Dr. Do received his PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara in sociology. After this section of the panel, we will conclude uh, with hearing from other panelists who will talk a little bit more about calls to action as to what we can do. Uh, without further ado, we're gonna get started. Um, we're gonna, and so Maha, <laughs> um, I just described a few examples of inequalities that have been revealed by COVID-19. Can you begin by sharing a little bit about the history of racism in the United States, as well as its impact on minority groups in, in, the, in the country today? Great. Uh, thank you so much, um, Ishaq, and, and, um, and welcome to all the panelists with us uh, today. Okay, so the history of, um, of racism in about eight to nine minutes is going to be incredibly challenging, but I'm gonna attempt it because my organization ING believes that it's incredibly important to know this history to be able to effectively dismantle uh, racism, which is based on policies that are reinforced by widespread uh, ignorance. I think many Americans really believe that certain groups of people belong in the position they do in society because they deserve it. So when a teacher tells a bullied Muslim child that I won't stop bullying, I won't stop the bullying against you because I think your people deserve it for starting wars against us, which is something that actually happened. That's an expression of gross ignorance that is based on what she believes about Muslims. So we might have policies in education that erase Muslim history from the curriculum, but that policy is reinforced by that teacher. And probably most of the adults in her school who believe that the only history you should be teaching about Muslims relates to terrorism. And that is in fact an issue that many Islamophobes are promoting saying that you can only teach about Islam if it is in the context of terrorism or what they would call jihadism. Otherwise you're being a disloyal American which is an outrageous claim on so many, level, uh, on so many levels. Islam is embraced by nearly 2 billion people living in 50 plus Muslim majority countries. And to say that uh, you should only teach about Islam in the context of terrorism is, is incredibly problematic. And so, and so while it's important that we work to improve the system of education to do a better job in teaching about all groups equally or assuming that the problem can be addressed by having an ethnic studies class, which is a good start, what we can do immediately to educate the public about the roots of racism and why we, sh and, and why we hold the perceptions uh, that we do about entire groups of people, such as Muslims, uh, uh, Blacks, Asians, Latinx, uh, Jews, uh, et cetera. And, and that's why education uh, is important. Uh, 
by educating people, we're actually empowering them to do something about it now, here and now, to change how we teach about diverse groups of people until the system of education can do a better job in teaching about diverse groups in the United States. And we also need to understand the history of bigotry and racism, racism in which an entire group of people are defined specifically by their skin color and then assigned certain characteristics, which then became embedded in society in every respect, really developed under colonialism, which began in the 15th century and continued all the way until the mid 20th century, so around 1950s. But how did Muslims, Jews, and other Christians become a race? Because they're ethnically diverse people who belong to a certain religion. And if they don't belong to one race, why do we include them in racism? Well, at some point in the five centuries of colonial history, Muslims and other non-Christians become racialized in the same way that black or brown people have had negative attributes associated with them so they also suffer the same bigotry. It's instructive to go through a very brief history of colonialism because it's, a, it's, an, it's an important story to know. The period of colonialism consisted of Western nations in, in particular England, France, Spain, Portugal, and the Netherlands competing in a race for colonization, both to gain resources and riches for their monarchies and to fund military campaigns against each other. During those five centuries, Europeans who represented about 8% of the world's land colonized over 80% of the world. And the colonized world includes, included lands in Africa, Asia, and the Americas, which were stripped off the resources, had their resources stripped, including uh, minerals such as gold and diamonds from Africa. Uh, spices and tea and cotton from India, and of course, the most horrific aspect of colonialism in the form of, is in the form of slavery, mostly from Africa, but also in the forced um, servitude of indigenous people uh, in other areas. This, of course, enriched European empires while impoverishing colonized lands. And remember that colonization doesn't end until the 1950s. The process of colonization included not only the military might of Europe, but also missionaries, corporations and their representatives, scholars and elites who begin to construct and create narratives about native people. These narratives were most, were most clearly illustrated by the words of those in power. So for example, narratives about native people in the Americas portray them as primitive and in need of civilizing. Narratives about Africans and justifications for slavery include those given by uh, Robert E. Lee, who said, uh, and I quote, that blacks are immeasurably better off here than in Africa, morally, physically, and socially. The painful discipline they're undergoing is necessary for their further instruction as a race. This is uh, Robert E. Lee. President uh, Grover uh, Cleveland, the late 1800s, described Chinese immigrants as an element ignorant of our constitution and laws impossible of assimilation with our people and dangerous to our peace and welfare. Narratives about Muslims and Arabs and travelogues often focused um, on the plight of Muslim women and the idea that they needed, they needed saving by Westerners, ideas that many Americans still believe about Muslim women today. These narratives that were created centuries ago were institutionalized through education from the university on down, as well as in films, in literature, in news reporting, and of course, more recently, uh, through the internet and social media. So when 9-11 happens, Muslim Americans become targets of hate crimes and lumped in with the terrorists, not because all Muslims are terrorists, but because we have a history in the United States of Muslims being portrayed as uncivilized, barbaric, backwards, and these stereotypes persist in public school education, despite the fact that Muslims contributed immensely throughout history in such fields as math, science, medicine, literature, long before the Renaissance. But also in the media, both then and now, in which terrorism by Muslim individuals is covered 10 times more than terrorism by white supremacists. And this is one of the main reasons why Muslims continue to experience hate crimes uh, today. 
So when a lady sitting next to me on a plane confided in me after an hour of a good conversation that she was afraid to board the plane because she thought I might blow it up. That also stems from these narratives that were created about Muslims and Arabs. And this is what we now call implicit bias, which is a very polite term. Um, it, it, it is a visceral reaction one might have towards Muslims like me in hijab, black men, Latinos, Jews, Asian Americans, Native Americans, Sikh people and, and so forth. And those reactions are not benign. They often lead to hate crimes, discrimination in the workplace and housing and courts and the justice system or even in hospitals when you go in for a treatment. And we're witnessing these biases even in a pandemic which should bring people together. Uh, for example, countless articles in Western countries have featured images of Muslim men and in congregational prayer, women in hijab, in headscarves, when discussing COVID-19, which conveys subtle messages that link Muslim religiosity to infection and, and deadly contagion. And this is, this is why we need to understand the roots of these negative perceptions and how they're constructed about an entire group of people that have absolutely no basis in facts. Although we didn't create these false narratives, we, black, brown, and white folks have an obligation to work to change them. And this begins with an understanding of the roots of these perceptions, as well as the very critical tasks, task for all of us of increased self-awareness, education, and vigilance to change it. Thank you. Thank you, Maha. Um, we're now going to move on to Pastor Coloma. Uh, Pastor Coloma, uh, Black communities have been among the populations disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Can you speak to this and the history behind this level of systemic racism? Yes, um, thank, thank you um, so much for that great introduction, Maha, and thank you, Ishaq, for um, this moment. In Illinois, 43% um, of the people who have died from COVID-19 and 28% 20, of the confirmed cases are African-American, while they only make up 15% of the population. In Michigan, 40% of those who have died and a third of the confirmed cases are African-American, while they only make up 14% of that state's population. In Louisiana, 70% of the people who have died are African-American, while they only make up um, a third of the state's population. To, on top of that, um, this is not really an accurate picture because we are not receiving full data from states such as Georgia, South Carolina, and many others are not providing information. The reality is this, is that America's obsession with one's skin color in determining their place in society has led to the creation of systems that were historically founded that perpetrate till this day. As simply as chattel slavery, bringing black, black people across in the middle passage and making us a slave um, class in this country. And that leading to the civil war, um, which was which was basically fought over race and still leading into Jim Crow has defined the black experience in America. I think we are seeing the fruits of this experience right now because of certain things that happened in the early um, 1900s. As the Great Migration happened, which was the single greatest move of people in the world from the Deep South to Northern areas such as Chicago, Detroit, New York City, you started seeing policies such as redlining, um, redlining, um, redlining racism, lack of job security, lack of, um, lack of opportunity, leading people into bad life situations. One of the um, things as I was doing research for this moment was one of the things that dominated African-American culture was the fact that we did not have access to certain jobs or certain career paths so that now we see the manifestation, a lot of postal workers are African-American, a lot of service workers are African-American, a lot of labor is African-American, and they disproportionately are impacted by this disease. 
I think we are reaping the fruits, unfortunately, of hundreds of years of racism. And it's now manifesting itself in the death of a specific parts of our population. I know some people will say, you know, this is America, they could have brought themselves up by their bootstraps, they could have done other things. But the reality is, is when there are glass ceilings, there are exclusions, there are red lines, there are things that marginalize and push people to the side implicitly or not implicitly. Implicitly or directly, we now live in a culture that has marginalized a class and group of people because of their skin, and now we're living that fruit. Um, it becomes very frustrating to me right now when um, people like the Surgeon General um, start making commentary like there are life choices, like don't drink, don't smoke, um, eat better, and you know it wouldn't affect the African American population. When you look at America, um, our country suffers from the highest rate of comorbidity across all ethnicities, um, and but the Black population is innate is significantly more impacted by COVID because of systematic and structural issues that are there. If you were to start comparing those that have high blood pressure, diabetes, all of that across different races and ethnicities, you will notice there's parity across the, a good amount of them, but the black population is suffering because of the structural and systemic issues. I know um, many people are doubting it. Many people are like, is this just another thing? But I would encourage them to say, when you start looking at patterns, let's just start from chattel slavery, going through slavery, going through Jim Crow, going through um, the industrial complex through the 60s and 70s, start looking at three strikes you're out, the war on drugs, and then you get to today, it is no wonder that we, we are now, we are now susceptible more to this virus. How can I believe America do better? First, we have to be honest with the impact it's having. We have to be targeted with testing and strategic with government efforts. This can't be a debate on Fox News or CNN. We need to be in these communities right now working because this is not people feeling bad. These are people dying. This is not something to be talked about. We have people that are dying right now and if we do not address this, we're going to see more people die. And the fact that we haven't responded is shame on our country. Because what is the value of a life? So, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Kalama. Um, Rabbi Melanie, would you be able to share a little bit about how these historical and present uh, connections relate to the Jewish American community? I'm glad to do that. Um, when people think of American Jews, they think of a group that's white and affluent. And so I think people wonder why anyone would consider Jews as a vulnerable group. And it is true to some extent that these perceptions are correct. Only about a quarter of American Jews are people of color, though in different parts of the world it's different. And something less than 10% of Jews earn less than $15,000 a year with perhaps another eight to 15% earning less than $30,000 a year. Many, but not all Jews enjoy a degree of privilege. And we often see our role as using that privilege in the battle to make America a more just and compassionate society. Jews are only about 2.5% of Americans, but in overwhelming numbers, Jews voted for and worked for Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. And in the 2018 off-year election, 85% of Jews voted for the Democrats. But while it is true that many Jews are persons of privilege, it is also true that Jews are the victims of a form of bigotry, of othering, that we call anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism comes and goes, rising and falling, according to the needs of the larger societies in which Jews live. 
in unsettled times, in times of fear and economic dislocation, anti-Semitism tends to rise as people buy into anti-Semitic stereotypes and myths to try to explain the trouble they are going through. Over the past 2000 years, a variety of accusations have been levied against the Jewish people that we are lazy or we are too hardworking and break the curve, that we are arch capitalists and control the economy or that we are communist agitators and destroy the markets, that we are too clannish and we care only for our own or that we are insidious infiltrators who intrude inappropriately into the general society. The range of these accusations, which have historically also included anti-Jewish statements from the church and church leaders, have left the Jewish community vulnerable to expulsions and anti-Jewish riots, to the burnings of homes and books, synagogues and shops, and ultimately of people as well. In the United States, anti-Jewish sentiment has been expressed in immigration restrictions and in the past in the exclusion of Jews from many companies and educational institutions, as well as swimming pools, hotels, country clubs. Anti-Semitism flared in the 1920s with the influx of Jews from Eastern Europe, but then it was associated with the Nazis and discredited as anti-American in the decades after World War II. This allowed Jews to benefit from civil rights legislation like the Fair Housing Act. Since 2016, we have seen a dramatic rise in anti-Semitism in the United States as marginal elements have been emboldened and inserted their beliefs about Jews wanting to do evil and having the power to control other minorities into the mainstream of American thought. Most recently with the coronavirus conspiracy theories about the Jews as a source of contamination or as masters who use the virus as a way to gain wealth and power have circulated. There were attacks just this week by neo-Nazis on two synagogues in Alabama, as well as frequent Zoom bombing of swastikas and statements urging death to the Jews into Jewish worship and study spaces online. In some parts of our country, Jews who wear distinctively Jewish religious garb are afraid to be in public places because of the series of recent attacks. So how do we respond? First, we need to focus on allyship on working with those who understand othering and the use and the power of symbols that are used against a minority. Second, as individuals, we need to speak up, not only when we are the targets, but whenever someone is the victim of harassment and racist language. And finally, we need to vote and encourage others to vote. We need to use our political might to fight the structures of racism and inequality in our society and to remove conspiracy theorists from the mainstream of American life. They are a threat to the Jewish community, to other minority groups. They are also a threat to our democracy as well. I'd like to take just another uh, couple of seconds to share one slide, if I might. Um, and just describes the different forms that these stereotypes take, um, the different forms that prejudice takes against the Jews. And unfortunately, the way that this is present, not only in the United States, but all around the world. This was published in the Wall Street Journal. Thank you so much for this time to share with you. Thank you so much, Rabbi Melanie, for sharing that and for sharing the statistics on prejudice, especially. It's really important to recognize the correlation between attitudes and perceptions and then hate crimes and bigoted acts that stem from those. Um, we're gonna conclude this section of the panel with Dr. Doe. Dr. Doe, can you elaborate a little bit on the history of racism and bigotry against Asian Americans in the United States? 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so one of the things that I think if you are watching this um, that you should see and have in common is that a lot of these things is what W.E.B. Du Bois began with his book on the, the, the soul of Black folk, where he argued that the issue of the 20th century is that of race. Um, and so for Asian Americans, one of the things you'll see is that um, even before they arrived to the shores, they were painted as foreigners, as Orientalists, right? As Orientalism, this exotic, these kind of different beings, but can never become part of society. Um, so that's the first part of the imagery that we have in terms of what Asian Americans or Asians before coming here. And then of course, when we talked about um, the idea of colonization and how they went to Japan, they went to um, the Philippines, we went to um, Japan, uh, China and so on, that also reinforces that. So one of the things that we'll see is that for Asians, at least we are divided into di two different waves. So the first period is that right immediately after the gold rush, right? So when the Chinese and later on the Japanese and the Filipino and Koreans and so forth were brought in, they were primarily brought in as laborers. Um, and therefore they were brought in without the intention of allowing them to become part of our society. Um, and we can see that through the laws and regulations that were passed. So for example, we had a lot of acts and laws that were passed that didn't allow them to become US citizens. We had segregation laws, we had housing um, laws that didn't allow them to be able to rent or even to purchase farm. And so they had to go around that. Um, and so that's kind of the first part of it. And for Asian Americans, they have always been seen as the other, right? So because of the ways in which they look, um, and the way that we are seen in the social media, in, I'm sorry, in, in the media, um, they've always seen as the perpetual foreigner. Ron Takaki talked about this racial uniform that we, that we carry with us. So no matter how many generations we are here, we're always going to be seen as, as these foreigners. So that's the first part of it. Um, the second part of it is when we come to post-1965, um, whereby the United States decided, uh, because we were trying to change the minds and hearts of the rest of the world, that we wanted them to see us as this open society whereby we can become the world leader. Um, and as a result of that, we passed this Immigration Act in 1965, which fundamentally changed the fundamental structure of our racial sort of uniforms, right? The way that that happened was that now we removed the national origins. Um, and so now we allow a lot more people to come and we are sort of telegraphing to the rest of the world that we're now much more open. And as a result of that, we have a lot more immigrants coming in. They were also brought in though, primarily as labor, right? So even if we think about them, um, what they were fulfilling was a job um, or a niche that we needed. So we had very educated folks. So the 1965, post-1965 immigrants tended to be well-educated. They tended to be professionals. So you have doctors, you have lawyers, you have engineers, you have all these folks that later on contributed to this notion of the model minority myth. Right. So again, one of the things that that happens is that now you have this bifurcation of the Asian American community. On one hand, we were seen as a yellow peril. So as soon as we arrived to these shores, we didn't want the Chinese, we replaced them with the Japanese, then the Filipinos and so on. And then post 1965, now we bring these folks in and now all of a sudden they become this sort of modern minority, which in effect pits us against other communities. So one of the other concepts that plays along with this notion of racism is this notion of divide and conquer, right? In, in many ways, we think about it as this zero sum game, whereby because I win, you lose. And as a result of that, anytime we have eco economic downturns, we always scapegoat. And the scapegoat communities tended to be communities of color. Um, we don't have um, an expert in the Latino community today, unfortunately, but if you look at that, that, par that history, it pretty much parallels all the things that we talked about, right? So all of these minority groups have seen, and then if you add in the religion component to that, that also contributes to that. So one of the things that I think we begin to see is the rise of violence against Asian Americans. In these times, um, it's very sort of, it's like it's become normalized. So what you begin to see is all of these um, structural, um, social, inequities um, because of the coronavirus 19 that reveals how it's different impacts us. So previous speakers talk about how it's impacting different communities. And you can see that very clearly, right? So this is the call for us to realize that how do we change this? One way to do that is to really understand the structural conditions and the social conditions and the economic conditions that 
sort of allows this to happen. Um, so for the Asian Americans, if you go back to the media images, they have always been seen as the foreigners. And as such, it's very easy to target them. So that's one thing that I really wanted to caution. And I wanna conclude this segment by talking about W.E.B. Du Bois, right? Because he, when he went and made that statement, he made it in London at the very center of power of colonization. And he challenged us, right? And this was in 1909. He challenged us to think about race in the 20th century. We're not in the 21st century and we're talking, still talking about racism. So this is the moment that all the communities have to come together to try to find ways to either eradicate this or to educate people so that they have a better understanding of why it is that we are in this position. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Doe, and thank you again to all of our panelists so far who've elaborated a lot more on the histories behind a lot of the structural racisms that we're seeing so clearly today. I'd like to just mention that if anyone has any comments or reflections on anything that the panelists have mentioned, you can feel free to write that in the chat on the Facebook platform. We're now going to move on to the final part of our webinar, which deals with what audiences can do to counter racism. We're going to start with Cynthia Choi, the co-executive director of Chinese for Affirmative Action, CAA. Cynthia has led local, state, and national community-based organizations working on a range of issues, including reproductive justice, gender violence, immigrant and refugee rights, and environmental justice concerns. Following Cynthia, we'll hear from Pastor Jeff Moore, the president of the San Jose Silicon Valley chapter of the NAACP. Pastor Jeff Moore is a graduate of San Jose Christian College. Following Jeff, uh, I will conclude with some calls to actions from our Intercultural Speakers Bureau. So Cynthia, can you get us started on what communities can do to challenge um, what we're hearing about today? ING, and, and thank you to um, all the speakers who've made an excellent case for knowing our history and to be informed by our history. Um, so this question about what we can do, we all do to dismantle racism is an important one, but I must frame it um, by starting with that Structural racism requires collective action. It requires an institutional response and it requires accountability for addressing racism. And so um, I want to uphold that because it requires our ongoing commitment to uphold these values of justice, compassion and equity. So the way that I'd like to talk about this work is um, in terms of the inner and outer work that we all can do and participate in and requires that. And I like to think of it as, as a muscle that if you don't use it, it will atrophy. So with regard to the inner work, um, our panelists before talked about understanding our history, understanding the history of slavery, colonialism, genocide, US foreign policy, and how that has impacted um, the reasons why many of us are here um, and why how the Native Americans were impacted as the original people here. And at the same time, we should recognize that um, throughout history, there has been a history of resistance. And that has actually made our country stronger. Um, dissent has made our country stronger. Um, and organizing has made our country stronger. Um, I also want to say that it doesn't have to be an abstract exercise. You can actually start with something personal, understanding who the people were, where you were living now, who were the original people, where do your people come from, and understanding the experiences of immigrants and other people who make up your, your community. I think it's through this process that we also begin to recognize our own privilege around race, class, immigration status, gender, and the intersections of those. So as an Asian American woman, I have to understand that my interactions with law enforcement is going to be different from an African American man. My immigration status as a US citizen is going to be a factor versus somebody who is undocumented in this country. And that should be the lens that we look at the world and look at our place in the world. The outer work that I think is, is equally important is that we have to be 
committed to be defenders of justice where, wherever and whenever we can, whether that's in the workplace, on public transit, in grocery stores these days, and when schools open, as We have to ask ourselves personally as an Asian American, how can I be outraged against the anti-Asian racism and not be equally outraged by the disproportionate deaths of African Americans and Native Americans or the economic hits that the Latinx community is encountering and that Jews along with Asian Americans have been embroiled in conspiracy theories that we are responsible for this pandemic. So these are the things that I think is important as we think about why do we accept this? And why, are we, why aren't we asking, why is this happening? It was mentioned that we also can do so much by being engaged. And for those of us who can vote, we want people to be engaged and, to, and that doesn't necessarily limit ourselves to voting. Being civically engaged can mean lots of different things. Volunteering, going to your school community, doing what you can to speak out, to make your community, your neighborhood better. We also think that it's important to speak to your heart and your capacity. So some people may not be comfortable in protesting the separation of families that are being and children that are being put in cages. But could you consider donating or volunteering at an immigrant and refugee rights organization? Can you think about ways that fill your heart and connect you to other communities that you may not have an opportunity to engage with and to know? I want to end with what I think is a very uh, uplifting story about how we show solidarity. I want to lift up the story of Suru for Solidarity, which is an organization whose mission is to end the incarceration of families and children who are being led by Jack because no one uh, stood Cynthia, up for can them. Can you repeat that sentence? It cut out. You said you were being led by, and then it cut out. Oh, I'm sorry. And it's being led by Japanese Americans who were incarcerated as children during World War II and because no one stood up for them. And so even during this pandemic, when we are sheltering in place, they are going to protest and show up at a detention center in their cars with large banners speaking out and speaking out for those children so that they know that those who us who can are speaking up for them. So we have to learn from our history in order to stop his, repeating history and crimes against humanity. So thank you. Thank you, Cynthia, for uh, really cohesively bringing a lot of that together. Uh, Pastor Jeff, uh, would you mind um, continuing on with our session here? to talk a little bit more about ideas from um, your organization, the NAACP. Thank you for having me. And um, um, despite the progress of Black American and other minorities, there's a ghostly aberration of racial bigotry that's hanging over this nation. And the growing vehemence of racial hostility throughout the land. Given the sorry example that has been set by this administration, it should not come as any surprise that hate is ravaging our communities. No is surprised at this administration's lack of response to what we're currently facing. But we are defined by the battles we dare to fight. The challenge before us is to keep hope alive despite the magnitude of bar barriers. The impact of COVID-19 and the accompany accompanying economic recession will worsen the American housing crisis and likely force households to make trade-offs between food, medicine, energy, housing. This problem isn't new. And we know that the impact is mostly felt by people of color in this country. As a civil rights organization and as stewards of human rights, this outbreak calls on us to maintain vigilance and lift our voice to demand the policies and practices that will preserve the well being of all. We must address the systemic underpinnings of inequality. Because of the 
residential segregation, neighborhoods that are mostly black and brown tend to be medically underserved. Residents in these areas often rely on federal codified health centers for care, emergency room or outpatient care for preventative services. Many of our neighborhoods lack enough primary care and mental health providers to serve our residents adequately. What should the policymakers do is the question. What should be done to avert the catastrophe and reduce the harm of COVID-19? Well, the NAACP, we like to recommend the following that one is to improve access to the quality of care, incentivize the use of federal qualified health wide to address the COVID-19 pandemic. In Santa Clara, that means Ujima and other clinics that are, are spread out throughout the community that are actually in the community that serve these people of color. Uh, ensure dedicated resources for COVID-19 education, prevention, testing, sanitation, treatment, services in all institutions, and support, support social settings. We need to prioritize people who reside and depend on institutional and social support settings, including homeless shelters, domestic violence shelters, prisons, and juvenile hall detention centers. Experts are telling us that the crisis has yet to hit a peak and emphasize that people who are incarcerated are in grave danger. We all have a responsibility to try to stem the spread of COVID-19. We need to release individuals who do not pose a danger to the public and can prevent them from being exposed in prison or jails create a safer environment for those who remain there and help protect our entire community during this pandemic. Sounds like Silicon Valley NAACP seeks relief in light of COVID-19 to identify people who can be safely released from prison and jail, including those who are at high risk of illness due to age, those who are being held pre-trial, and those who are already scheduled to release in the near future. We're also calling for a robust reentry, a robust reentry system that is ensured that those who are getting out from incarceration are equipped and supported to stay the safe and stable upon release from COVID-19 crisis. And the implementation of a video visiting platform for those who are still in the system so that they can still be connected with their loved ones during this time at no cost to them. So we're really hoping that cities, counties, states, municipalities would step up to the plate and understand that this is a human human rights issue. And if we're going to be America, if we're going to be all that we can be, we must put our citizens first, regardless of their economic status. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor John, for sharing uh, those resources with us. I'm gonna conclude. Uh, with some um, resources from ING. So as I mentioned earlier, this panel is an extension of our Intercultural Speakers Bureau. And there's a few things that audiences can do on a personal and then institutional basis to challenge bias, bigotry, and racism. On a personal level, it's important to start with ourselves. Recognizing from our panelists that these bias have stemmed from certain points in history, they've now seeped into all of our society so that they are prevalent and that many of us hold them uh, against ourselves internally as well as against others. We need to recognize this and then start to undo these biases. We can do this by challenging our instinctive thoughts and assumptions about other people. When I see a person of X background, what do I think of? Is the thought positive or negative? If it's negative, how can I change my perception of them? This process really needs to become habitual because unfortunately we've been socialized with these negative images for most of our lives. As we work on our own biases, uh, we also should be aware of those in our own sphere uh, that may express opinions or, or beliefs that portray other groups in negative lights. How can we be vigilant and compassionate to guide those in our, in our sphere uh, to undo their biases? As we've heard from other panelists, bias can turn into bigotry and Cynthia, um, this panel as well as last, last webinar um, mentioned how to respond to bigotry. So I'm not gonna take time to repeat that here. I invite you to go watch that section. Um, but I would say that it's really important to check in with those who are experiencing or who might be experiencing bullying or bigotry or other forms of racism. We can politely ask if they need support and in what form. Uh, in the process though, it's really important to not make assumptions about others' experiences. We can also volunteer for community organizations that work to counter bigotry in various ways, whether through education or otherwise. There are several organizations on this webinar, all of whom I'm sure would take volunteers. 
Additionally, it's really important to engage with those who are different from ourselves. That doesn't mean tokening, tokenizing our friends, but what it does mean is making efforts to bring other perspectives into our lives. And finally, we can continue educating ourselves about these topics. Um, the handout that um, is on our site that mentions these calls as well as others contains articles, books, videos, and podcasts that enable um, one to use as a starting point to really dive deeper into a lot of the issues that panelists have discussed today. Recognizing that racism is not just an individual issue or it really is not an individual issue, it's, it's more of an institutional and systemic issue. What can we do on a large scale uh, that will help to challenge um, these systems? First of all, we can promote widespread training and education about implicit biases that will enable large groups of people to really work to challenge their assumptions about others. We can promote cultural diversity education in our institutions so that we can change the face and the culture of our institutions so that they are accepting of people of wide backgrounds who feel included and welcome. We can join or start groups or clubs in our spaces and work or school to work on discussing these issues because um, webinars like these cannot be one-time things. They really need to be ongoing where we're consistently working to address structural issues and structural problems. We can take to writing for our organization or school newspaper or blog. Uh, the more we spread the word on these issues, the more people we can mobilize to counter what's going on. We can create art projects and make public, public displays out of them. What figures and events throughout US history have been forgotten and how can we commemorate them? Additionally, our panelists described racist attitudes, many of which turn into state policies, both throughout history and at present. We really need to stay informed on potentially oppressive laws and policies and work against them in whatever capacity we can. We should continue conversations about the roots of racism in America and the United States in particular. Uh, this webinar is illustrating that in order, in order to solve the problem that we see today, we really need to understand where it's coming from. And finally, we can build community across difference. Grassroots relationships between people, between groups, like what we see with this diverse panel of speakers is ultimately what will help us uh, to move beyond transactional relationships to relationships that focus on care and allyship and center on that um, cohesion. And with that, we can create a critical mass that will turn the tide against um, our own issues, but also the issues of one another, recognizing that all of these issues that we're faced with right now are interconnected, whether they be um, against um, race or class or gender or sexual orientation. Um, April is a month in which Earth Day occurs in a few days and many unfortunate events that happen on Earth Day are canceled, but we can look at ways that climate change disproportionately affects uh, certain communities around the globe and around the equator. So with that, I wanna thank all of our guests for an inspiring session today. We really appreciate your time with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, if you are watching, please leave your reflections uh, or your comments in the chat. It's been really great reading some of the comments um, because you've helped to highlight and elaborate a little bit more on what some of our speakers have briefly mentioned. And finally, um, this is what concludes our last uh, webinar in this series, which is called Solidarity in the Time of Crisis. This recording, last week's recording, uh, as well as resources from our three organizations and others will be featured on ing.org backslash intercultural series. So you can go there and you can continue to watch them if you wanted to see something that you missed. Um, and as always, if you have any questions or comments, you can please email me at mail at ing.org. So I'm gonna thank the panelists once again. I'm gonna thank you all for your time. I really wish everyone the best of health and spirits um, and have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. <laughs>